The highest state of joy literally comes from a child in full play, in full self-expression, with full permission. This is, I think, one of the most important things that we can do on an individual level to actually shift the state of this planet is to heal our inner child. How do we do that? Where do we start? There's two things. We are vibrational beings. In a very practical way, you can raise your vibration. Here's what you do. This life will feel very effortless for you because you'll be playing a completely different game. I was so far out of who I was naturally inside that I found myself in prison serving a 12 year sentence and losing my freedom, I discovered my freedom. And in this time, look at the life that you have created. I've been studying high and low and traveling all over the world. And the one through line is, If you've been here for a while, you might remember this video that I made a few years ago about a man named Garen Jones who went from being homeless to becoming a multi-millionaire. I was releasing hate from my soul to the point where I forgave the two men who murdered my father. Garen has a pretty miraculous story from sleeping in his car for two years and then going to jail to heroically becoming a multimillionaire and creating his dream life. And from that moment, I've been free. Since then, Garen has continued to impact millions of people's lives with his content, his company Artist Power, and his transformational retreats. Garen strongly believes that the key to unlocking our full potential and creating our dreams is to heal and awaken the heart of the inner child. Start with taking yourself on an inner child date. Watch what happens within 30 days. In this conversation, we dive deeper into Garen's story, how to unleash your authentic expression and share your voice, how to create your dreams through healing the inner child, and how he is consciously parenting his three-year-old daughter, Soul, and his two-month-old son, Chief, alongside his wife, Blair. This starts during pregnancy, like, Day one. This interview is packed with so much gold and wisdom that you will be able to apply directly to your life. And I know it will support you on your journey of expansion. And before we dive in, make sure that you like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. This really supports us to continue making these videos. And without further ado, let's dive into this conversation with Garen Jones. Well, I invited you onto Sky Life again, so maybe I should. We did it again. <laughs> yeah, we knew we had to have you back on. For sure, we've been talking about it for a while. Yeah, I feel like this has been brewing. I would love to just meditate together for a moment, and then I know that you have your drum here and want to. My first language. Yeah, so we gotta get that going for sure. For sure. Yeah. Hi. I'm feeling hi. Right. Hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> so good to meet you in this very moment. Very much so, friend. Thank you for sharing that. That I felt that in my body, that activation just it's like a primal yeah. thing that comes online. We we came equipped with its sound and frequency and vibration. For me and my experience of unlocking 
my voice. Mm -hmm. I never consider myself musical mm. or a musician or good at music or yeah. singing, although I loved it. You know, I did theater, I did chorus, I was super into that expression when I was growing up, but I wasn't the best singer, <laughs> objectively, <laughs> in terms of did the way that- Did you ever intentionally practice, though? I did, um, yeah, I did singing lessons and stuff. Yeah. I just don't feel like it was a natural thing for me, and so I do feel that part of me just like stopped doing that because I felt like, oh, mm. I'm not that good at this. But now in my adult life, you know, I've discovered kirtan, and singing mantras yeah. and bhakti yoga, and that opened up my voice in a whole new way to sing just because it feels so good. And yeah. It's so healing. And to embrace now that new way of understanding how to use the voice has, has opened up so much for me. Um, but I think a lot of us, you know, we get taught uh, to shut those parts down if we're not good at something. I was actually going to bring that up because okay. you were like, because I was not good at singing. My first thing that I said was like, compared to who and what? Mm -hmm. Because if there's nothing to compare it to, then the measure of singing has no comparison. Therefore, you're just in the art of song, which is what Kirtan does. It allows you to bypass all of that stuff, and anytime you chant, it literally sends a signal to the brain that's directly connected to the body saying, here's the truth of expression. I call it the vibrational truth. So it literally bypasses mm -hmm. all those people who told you couldn't sing, mm -hmm. because in that expression, it goes straight. It goes brain body, yeah. boom, boom. You know, we're talking about inner child healing today is the theme of our conversation. It's yeah. so interesting and we just started right off on this topic because I do have memories of being a little girl singing around the house, like belting out a song. And then I had three little brothers and they would just be like, shut up, you're terrible, you know? And that impacted me. And my dad would also kind of, you know, shut it down or like laugh at me. And, and so that was not coming from a malicious place. And those are subtle things. But as children, we make meaning out of every moment like that. Absolutely. So I can recognize how those moments really did shut down my voice in a way. And so of course, that was not intentional on their ends. Uh, it's just brothers being brothers and you know, my dad being, you know, a dad. Like it's not anything they did um, with any type of malicious intent, but wow we forget how much those small moments matter for children who are yeah. making meaning of them. I, I, love, I love that you're bringing this up because I don't think most people have any idea the seeding process that happens in childhood domestication. But they do know the seeding process of language because it started with ABCs. We didn't know as five-year-olds that it was gonna turn into, you can now like read and write and you can you have rhythm and all of that started with the introduction of language, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and they were literally teaching you toning, patterning, how to make vowel sounds and all, that's literally the introduction of language. But if you know, if you do it over time, the ABCs turns into words, then sentences, then paragraphs, then essays, then books, then libraries. Everything that has a starting point has the same evolution process as ABCs. So someone who would say, oh no, stop singing. And when that child makes that meaning, that's a starting point, but it's the ABC version of that. And if that program is still running like an app on your phone that you don't close, then that loop is then going to involve, uh, evolve into that version of words, then sentences, then paragraphs and essays. And next thing you know, we wonder why the number one fear, even more than death, is public speaking. Where does that come from? I, nobody knows how to speak and be their natural expression, their vibrational truth, 
because of all of these little unconscious negative seeding that we turn into an entire forest by the time we're an adult. That's wild that that is the number one. Fear number one. Over death. More than death. Public speaking, which that just, it says so much about the conditioning of our society as a whole and how we're often, you know, conditioned to believe that what we have to say maybe doesn't matter or we're unworthy to speak it. So we don't say it. And we're afraid because when we get up in a group, in front of a group of people and express ourselves and we're public speaking, that the fear is that level of rejection. That is what our inner child is really what they're afraid of, is being yeah. rejected for authentic expression. Absolutely. And so this is you know, where we're going to dive into today is really how to heal this yeah. inner child, which mm -hmm. is your whole thing and your dharma on this planet. Literally, like... I, I've literally <laughs> been sent here to be a walking billboard and permission slip as authentic full self-expression in a world full of masks that don't even know that they have the key to unlock their own prison, that they don't have to justify and mask and kind of play themselves small. Yeah, and I feel there's so much alignment with your dharma and my dharma, which is- Hi, twin. I know, I feel like they're <laughs> like sole purpose twins in a way. Yeah. Because so much of my dharma that has evolved over the past few years of, you know, from the time we met until now, that's become so clear to me is how to support people and unleashing their expression in the digital dimension and yeah. how to share that on social media in a safe way yeah. in a world of social media that is objectively not so safe. The weapons of mass distraction. Mm -hmm. And how to take that and utilize it for healing, for expansion of consciousness, for authentic expression to thrive. And so I've been you know, unknowingly, I've been called into this purpose because I started on my channel just wanting to explore my curiosity, express myself creatively and share it. And then before I knew it, I was on this whole journey of self-discovery of how to do that in a way that felt safe to me, like creating yeah. my own safe, sacred space on my channel for that when I had so many people, you know, judging or misunderstanding or perceiving you and rejecting you in a certain way. Now it's like become such a passion of mine to support creators on that journey. Yeah. Because it's been for me, I've, I've been so empowered on the journey of discovering how to do that. You're literally taking what you've learned on your own journey as walking wisdom and sharing what's been tried, tested, and true for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the greatest kind of wisdom. There's people that study all the books and they get all the certifications, mm -hmm. everything, but their life doesn't match the information that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. I call those pro false prophets. Mm -hmm. But when somebody is, you can clearly see it, I'm a walking embodiment of the words that come out of your mouth. I will listen, I don't care what it is you're teaching. You're a walking embodiment of what's coming out of your mouth. I'm just like, wow, that, that's real. That's genuine passion right there. That's a genuine expression and you can't help but to share it. Mm -hmm. So I, I see that in you and I, that's because I also see it in myself. I was just gonna say that I see that fully in you. Like you are a walking embodiment of everything that you preach and teach. <laughs> and you live it, you breathe it, you are it. And so I am so grateful to, you know, share your yeah. wisdom again here on this channel. The first video we did impacted millions of people's lives. And it was so cool to witness that level of impact from yeah. what we created together. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're talking about the inner child. And so- How did Superman get his powers? Go ahead. Yeah. What were you like as a child? I was the person that got kicked out of everything. And I loved to sing. Not only did I love to sing, I loved to sing loud. I get kicked out of school. I would get 60 something discipline slips in one year. Why? Student disrupting class. Why? Student singing. So there was nobody in my life that was aware enough to be able to see every time I get in trouble is because I'm singing. Let's probably expose him into the environment of the thing that he can't stop sharing. I had been 
emotionally traumatized because every time this expression wanted to come out, somebody told me to shut up. Somebody told me I couldn't sing. I remember being five years old at my uh, Aunt Yvette's house. And, you know, the, my dad was drunk and there was a couple of drunk people there and all the kids would do like a talent show and they would sing whatever's on MTV. Michael Jackson's Moonwalker came on and I was like, yo, I'm about to sing because I want to get cheered for. And I went to go sing. Annie, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And, and then one by one, people were like, boo, boo, Garen, you can't sing. You can't dance. When I tell you, as a five-year-old, hearing that, it crushed my soul. The one saving light is my overly drunk fa father. I was like, hey, don't you, don't you tell my son what he can and cannot do. Garen, if you love it and it makes you happy, then you do what makes you happy. Don't, hey, don't you tell my son. And he... And so I had these two worlds calling, saying, don't express yourself because you're going to get booed. And then this other world saying, Karen, if you love it and it makes you happy, don't listen to them. Do what makes you happy. I listened to them for a very long time. And I didn't even know I had this one in my back pocket. So it wasn't until fast forward me living far out of my vibrational circumference. That's when you're living out of alignment to who you really are, doing what everyone else or what I thought everybody else wanted me to do because I needed a place to fit in. Because being me is not good enough because I, I would get booed and talked about. So I'll be what everybody else wants me to be. I was so far out of my dharma and who I was naturally inside that I found myself in prison serving a 12 year sentence. So I'm in prison not thinking I'm going to get out. My daughter was just born. So I had like everything against me. Two something years in prison. I was like, man, how did I get in here? How did I get in here? How did I get in here? And then we were allowed to, to watch movies once a month. And then uh, Shawshank Redemption came on, which is uh, the movie that was based out of prison. Um, and Tim Robbins says they can take anything they want away from me, but they can't take away my mind. And I was like, well, I, I know why I'm in prison. Because when I was free, I used to say every day, I feel like I'm so far away from where I'm supposed to be, like I'm in prison inside of my own body. I look up and I'm so far away in Europe in prison. I said, if I can think myself in prison, in that case, I'm a free man. And I said, what would a free, free person do? And a voice said, Garen, everything you used to love to do when you were a child that made you so happy. I used to love to sing. I used to love to dance. I used to love to motivate people. I would, six years old, I'd have this heat, heat in my stomach and I would speak from the heat and all of a sudden good things would happen. I didn't know what that was. Makes sense now that I speak on stages in front of 75,000 people effortlessly from the same heat. But that was the ABC version of what I'm actually here for. I didn't know that. I gave up on motivation. I gave up on singing. My favorite thing to do is running. I gave up on drawing. And all of a sudden, in prison, I actually discovered my freedom. And losing my freedom, I discovered my freedom. I started singing again. It made other inmates feel free. I started drawing and giving portraits. I wasn't thinking about what I'm going to get. It brought me so much joy to share my joy with other people. I started running 30 days, 60 something inmates running with me. And from there, I felt, not that I fought for freedom, I felt free. My mind was calm. So in there, I was freer than any aspect of out there because I was doing what everybody else wanted me to do when I felt free. And it's important that I take a long time, just a, quite a bit of time on this context as we go into the conversation because now you'll understand where the root of everything that I do comes from. When I felt free, like an, an embodiment of freedom is when the frequency overflows from your vessel, not like something you check off the list because of what you're doing. When I felt free, 
they magically called me into the office, which they had no reason. They tested the drugs three times, 6.2 kilos of heroin. That's when I felt like I was in prison. When I felt free, Jones, we retested the drugs. 90% was fake. And for the amount that was real, you've already done the time. You're free to go home. So I want to keep that right there because I invested and traveled all over the world figuring out what was that powerful that it could override anything that a human says and match in the physical equivalent how I felt. So for the last 18 years, I've been studying high and low and traveling all over the world. And the one through line is the higher the embodiment of joy, this plastic universe will wrap itself around the continuous state of that frequency and the physical equivalent will match. The highest state of joy literally comes from a child in full play, in full self-expression, with full permission. Okay, quick pause to share something I know you're going to love. We are talking so much in this video about the importance of mindset. And if you're someone who is tired of feeling unmotivated or you really want to improve your life and get results, I challenge you to try a mindfulness meditation practice for 30 days. Having a consistent meditation and mindfulness practice has been a crucial component of my overall health and mental well being. So I want to share a really powerful tool. With with you if you are looking to implement this practice into your life and see results. Aura is a mindfulness and sleep app that won the Best of Apple Award and is used by over 7 million people. Aura is an all-in-one app for your well-being and sleep. It has thousands of meditations and so much more like CBT, life coaching, and breath work. Aura's content is created by hundreds of expert coaches and therapists around the world. And it is highly personalized to curate content specifically for you. Setting up your account is super easy. And from the very beginning, Aura is going to start learning your needs and preferences so that you can easily find the perfect thing to listen to. I'm a huge fan of Aura, and I know that it is going to completely change the way you experience daily meditation. I even created a special playlist for you with my favorite meditations on Aura. So I I would love to encourage you to commit to doing a 30 day meditation challenge with Aura and see what happens. And you can get started for free with Aura using my special link in the video description. The first 500 people to click on my link will get a free trial and an exclusive 25% off. Okay, that's it. Let's dive back into the conversation with Garen. So much to unpack. So much to unpack. <laughs> and thank you for providing the context of part of your story and your journey, because I think it's such a powerful example of something that you taught me, which is mindset is everything. Yeah. And that you had this light bulb moment in prison that what you do have access to is your mind and your mindset. And by activating those parts of yourself that you loved to feel free you were able to then manifest if you will if i don't know if there's a better word to use than that but to create the reality of actual freedom which was freeing yourself from a 12-year sentence in two years like there's no way to logically explain that not at all and so we're talking about these concepts of how our inner reality is you know, our outer reality is matching our inner reality and how, you know, the law of attraction or manifestation, all these principles that we hear and we discuss and are very, very buzzwordy and um, something that, you know, is very fun to study and understand, but you're actually like providing a very tangible example of this on an extreme level. And so I want to unpack some of what you've learned over yeah. these years of your journey mm -hmm. of studying this, because yeah. I feel it's often maybe misunderstood. We are trying to understand the laws of the universe and the laws of nature. There's so much. There's that, so much. Yeah. So if you had to break it down in a very simple way, um, mechanically from your research and understanding and, and study, you know, yeah. how does it function on like a scientific 
tangible level. You can be in a room full of people who don't like you. Nobody's talking and you can feel it. You can be in a room full of people who love you. Nobody's saying a word. Grandmother walks in the room with pecan pie or something like that. All of a sudden this energy just brushes and you can feel it. So what that tells me is there's much more than this meat suit. I walk by you and all of a sudden there's a shock and I'm just like, man, we are vibrational beings. If I just try to think from the context of this 3D reality inside of this meat suit while my eyes are blinking and I can't explain it and I can do this with my hands and with my foot and then all of a sudden I get a cut and it just, my skin grows back. I'm like, there's something very potent inside of there called intelligence. You're the sum total of the five closest people that you continuously hang out with. If they gossip, if they're broke, if they complain all the time, if they're tearing people down, you'll be the fifth one. Why? Because there's a resonance inside. Resonance is like a language. But let's talk about this practical thing called either raising your vibration or lowering your vibration. Yes, I wanted to ask you about that exact concept. What does that mean on a practical level? When you feel bad, you can look at things in your life and just pay attention when your random phone, phone screen cracks and you feel bad or the breakups happen or you get fired from your job and you're like, why does everything just keep happening? You keep sending that spiral and everything. Most people think it's outside in but it's actually inside out. So whatever you can do to feel your absolute best, good health, what you're listening to, who you hang out with, what you're eating, all affect the vibration inside of you and a vibration emits a frequency. Think of terms of a radio. Whatever station you're dialing, that's who can hear that station. Most people are on static, confusion, have no aim in life, don't know how to focus, getting caught up in the, the weapons of mass distraction, which is why you're so great at what you're doing, how you're leading in the vibe tribe and everything. But understanding vibration now starts to make sense why Nikola Tesla said, if you wanna know the secrets of the universe, think of in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So if all humans are made of vibration, and if I sing a high enough pitch, a glass will break. Well, then that means these blocks that are inside of me also have a resonance that if you can find the right resonance, you can lift the blocks. So what I discovered in my study is that if I focus on vibration and stay there and learn everything that I can in many different facets and ways, I'll have a way to actually connect with every human on the face of this planet. That's the one thing that brings us all together. Boom, can we have a soul on soul conversation? All of a sudden constructs disappear because the more titles you have, the more you're in prison. I'm a vegan, I'm a non-vegan, I'm a pop, 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 pop. And all of a sudden I was like, why do I, I don't feel seen? I was like, because you boxed yourself in with a thousand different titles. So that's why for me, I don't call myself a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ, but I don't associate with re re religion. I was like, no, here's the one title you get. I'm Garen Jones, who just happens to be. Therefore, the power stays here and I don't give my power to any box outside of me. And going back to the conversation around the inner child, yeah. so when we're children, we are we're not boxed in. We, we don't, we, we just express because we want to. It because, is a natural part of the process. Right, because it feels good because, you know, we desire to express in a certain way or explore different parts of our identity and then the world starts putting us into boxes and then we put ourselves into those boxes. And then it's like an unlearning that has to happen as, as, as an adult to dismantle these chains of identity we've, the world has placed on us and that we've placed on ourselves. It is kind of a scary process to dismantle it's your identity. very scary, especially <laughs> if you were trained in fear. 
Yeah. And here's how that works. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, a dog. I don't even talk about a human. The, neighbor get, the neighbor's dog gets into the neighbor's yard, and then he says, if, you, if your dog does that again, I'm going to call the puppy pound. So he puts a shock collar on his neck. At first, the dog just runs around out free, natural expression. All of a sudden, the second he hits that shot, boom, it sends a signal to the brain, pain, fear, body, fear, memory foam. Does it again, boom, pain, fear, body, fear. Within one month of that shock that's trained in fear and pain, you can take the shock collar off, but it doesn't take the shock collar off the memory foam of the body. Mm -hmm. So therefore that dog will stay behind that invisible wall of fear for the rest of its life. That makes sense. Okay, now take out the dog and put a human. You turn on the news programs. Whose mind do you think they're programming? Everything is about fear. So little kids from ages zero to seven is the installation period. Most everything that most adults do is based off of things that were installed from zero when you weren't even conscious to the ages of seven. That's why I say adults are deteriorated children. That zero to seven time window that you're talking about mm -hmm. is an actual different brainwave state. Way different. It is, we know that it's the brainwave state of theta brainwaves which is the most suggestible brainwave state. It is the brainwave state that we go into when we're in hypnosis and we're you know, wanting to rewire, reprogram beliefs. That is the brainwave state you go into. It's a very meditative state. Those years, you are so highly suggestible like from a just neuroscience perspective. Yeah. So it's so important like, to remember as well that that is like what's happening to kids is they're actually being programs in that time period. 100%. Well, it actually starts before that. This starts during pregnancy, like day two, mm -hmm. day one. As soon as Blair said, I'm pregnant, I said, I know Blair's going to start nesting. I'm going to start nesting too. I'm going to get my body right. I'm sorry, eating clean, whatever quarrels I have with my wife, we're going to clear all of that because while that seed is in the womb, I want it to have the best vibration, which is just like you can structure water, you can structure a seed and our body is mainly water. So that vibration is literally structuring the water that the seed inside of the womb is holding and it's recording everything. Then there's birth. So as the baby is born and what we, what we like to do is one, we come up with an order. There's an order in the house. God, family, everything else. Now, a lot of times people just focus on their kids first and not themselves. But if you focus on the kids first and not yourselves, you will literally teach those kids how to put themselves last in everything. So Blair and I, it's like, we gotta have us. It's gotta be me and you first. And the kids get to benefit from the overflow that we first given to ourselves. Which is such a wonderful concept to explore because the norm, the, the norm, like 90% yeah. of parents probably, or 99% are putting the kids first. Cause it's almost like an instinct. I think there's some type of like evolutionary biological instinct to you protect your kids. You put the kids first, but yeah. then that is like seeping into everything. It's their learning pro. They're and, watching you put yeah. yourself last. Right. So then how do you put yourself first, but then still like make sure that kids are getting what they need first and foremost? Like how do you function? So here, 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 here's the, the philosophy I came up with. People don't do what you say. They do what they see. There's a lot of people who talk, but they don't realize that their actions can speak louder than any word that can come out of your mouth and your kids are watching every single one of your action, actions. They're recording the unspoken arguments and they can feel it in their solar plex. They can literally feel it. I could feel when, my, when I didn't know what argument was, when my parents were fighting. I was like, what's that feeling? And I'm standing outside of my mom and dad's room when I was four. Yeah. I didn't ever knew what it was like to having um, healthy closure when it comes to arguments. When Blair and I argue, when we have these out of alignment conversations, we make up 
with the kids right in front of us. Now the kids, even though they don't quite understand, but they're watching a model of some specific formula, they are much smarter than we think they are. They're seeing healthy resolve. And we literally say, chief, this is not your fault. So this is not your fault. Mommy and daddy are just learning how to communicate better. And then they watch us resolve. We watch soul at two, early twos, resolve with her friends the exact same way. So what you think you're hiding travels right to the child's DNA. You're like, but they haven't seen me do it. Yeah, but the DNA is encoded. So that's why it's important for the parents to be the most powerful representation, do whatever healing work that you can, work on whatever issues you had as a little kid so it does not transfer. Mm. This is, I think, one of the most important things that we can do on an individual level to actually shift the state of this planet. 100%. Is to heal our inner child. So how do we do that as adults? Where do we start? How do we go down this process, especially, you know, if you maybe don't have access to teachers or guides, Absolutely. like how do you suggest people start on this process? Here's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave, uh, there's two things. I had a client who, who, successful business, great husband, great kids. She walked in, she goes, something's missing. I was like, what did you used to love to do as a little kid that made you the most happy? She was like, I used to love to dance. I'm like, her whole countenance shifted. When was the last time you danced? 20 years ago. I said, you got kids, right? She said, yeah, two. I said, what would happen to the relationship if your daughter goes, mom, 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 listen to me, mom, mom. For 20 years, how would the relationship would be? And you didn't acknowledge that kid for 20 years. She said, it wouldn't be one. Yeah, no emotional closure. So if you know what that feeling is, that's the exact same thing that happens when your inner child, the things you used to love to do that brought you so much joy, is not getting met, nurtured, paid attention to. So maybe you, I know you like, you do the cards and everything. Maybe you used to love to do cards and all of a sudden, every time you see cards, that little thing flickers up inside. Consider that your inner child going, mom, mom, pay attention to me. And every day that goes by is an emotion not getting met. It will produce inside of you the same thing as the lack of relationship for 20 years between the mom and the daughter. But there, all, there won't be a connection to your soul. So it'll be a disconnect from your soul. So what you do is once a week, Start with taking yourself on an inner child date, not the adult. <laughs> so if it's cards, if it's dancing, if it's, if it's swimming, imagine yourself. I used to love this and allow yourself to drop into the energy of who, of, of when you used to swim and who is around and you take that person swimming 30 minutes a week. Watch what happens within 30 days because it's an energy that's connected to your heart. The most powerful frequency in the world is the EKGs of the heart. So when you tap into it, it has the ability to raise your vibration and whatever the health of your vibration determines what tuning it, it, it dials to the station. So it's like, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. Your vibration mm -hmm. attracts your tribe nation. It tracks the life that you actually want. That lady came back. She was like, you wouldn't believe it. I got a raise. I'm having better sex. I mean, it's just like everybody just changed around me. No, homie. You changed. You start loving on yourself. You started treating yourself better. You started seeing yourself, you start nurturing yourself from the little kid. And that little kid started trusting. Ideas start coming back. Libido comes back. All these different things. It's just been held by a spiritual dam because the needs aren't getting met. Mm. That's number one. Number two, forgiveness practice. 
letting go of resentment. A lot of crazy things happen to us as children. Everybody has some type of childhood trauma of some 100%. kind that is subconsciously running the show of their adult life. So here's the last thing. Yeah. Here's what you do. How about you drop into the energy of the moment something negative happened. They told you to shut up. They told you to this. They told you and they, you, you were too loud. You were too much or whatever. And allow yourself to feel that feeling that you had providing you're in a safe environment and just take a pillow and say what you always wanted to say and allow that expression to come out because all expressions are valid, even the ones that you stuff down and then cover it up with other stuff. And then say everything you want to say, you fucking, you didn't, you didn't let me, you didn't love me, you abandoned me, oh, you fucking, I can't believe you did it. And then when you get it all the way out, and you say, and I still love you. And something about the and clears out the weeds and plants another healthy seed. You do that and notice how your energy starts to shift. All we need is just a little bit of shift. And I would do that coupled with once a week doing something that you love to do that just brings you more even if it's underwater basket weaving, and it sounds crazy to everybody, but you love it. What even is that? <laughs> you do what makes you happy, and don't listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. What you said about allowing yourself to feel what you need to feel, I think is such an important piece to somatically feel it come out of your body. You know, sometimes we, we don't want to do that. We mm -hmm. don't want to go back to the feelings you that don't felt go back like in. shit. Like we're constantly avoiding pain and seeking pleasure as humans. Just that's how we're designed. Um, and so why would you want to go back to feeling pain that was so terrifying and awful when, you know, you were a, a little child that felt that and then had to figure out how to shove it down or protect yourself or put all this armor up. But that I think is like one of the most important parts of this type of healing is to somatically actually feel it and let it be released and liberated. The body is holding on to this energy. The subconscious is holding on until we can create a sacred safe container for it to be expressed and felt. And I've had so many experiences through my journey of this type of somatic healing where at first I didn't understand, okay, what, why am I like convulsing and releasing all this and shaking and crying? Yeah. And then you actually realize on the other side of that, the deep opening and liberation and freedom and expansion that happens. And you Gifts can, behind it, spiritual yeah. gifts behind it, so many things. And I've had so many shifts happen in my life that is not noticeable, tangible ways of being shift and results change from that type of work. Sometimes we want to intellectually um, get ourselves there or you know we go to talk therapy and we're just talking and talking in loops of our story but the story lives in the body. Yeah. The body needs to move the energy. I call it vibrational truth. Mm -hmm. There's head truth which is full of lies and there's vibration of truth. Vibrational truth which is found in the inherent wisdom in the body which no lie can penetrate. Like we're literally energetic beings. Energy goes where energy flows. But this is how I even got into all this work. I know some people are like, well, this shit is deep. I thought y'all was gonna talk about inner child and play. It's still play. But the thing about it is I wanna create a, a space and a conversation that allows people to authentically play. Mm -hmm. Not play to escape, mm -hmm. not play to avoid your day, not laugh to avoid and try to fit in. The genuine play where there's no effort in trying to be seen in a world of the unseen. <laughs> and so I that we can hear <laughs> the real time expression of the child. <laughs> so she probably fell off. Is the she slide. saying you're calling for you? She's calling for mommy. Okay. Well, I was gonna ask, like, when you know you have your kids, they're expressing, they're releasing, they're feeling some type of sadness, emotion. Like, what is your way of supporting them through that? I pick her up, and then I just hold her. 
you can't speak logic to somebody that is operating from the emotional realm. Mm. So you got to go in there, no matter how ugly or loud or you just hold and you hold and you hold. You want me to kiss it and make it feel better? You hold and hold and hold and hold. Say, are you sad? I'm sad. You tell me about it. I don't want to talk. And you just hold and hold and hold and hold and hold and hold and hold. Hold on one second. Yeah. Speaking of. <laughs> we'll pick it back up. So a little intermission for you to parent <laughs> in real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is so crazy. We were just talking about this and then the opportunity comes. Absolutely. There's nothing bigger in my life right now than choosing to be an extraordinary parent. Like, it, it's passive. I'm just going to tolerate this because we have the baby and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm tired and I'm just going to just do enough because I'm the parent. And then there's like choosing to be a parent. That's portal after portal after because every single one of your insecurities, your patience, your your like everything that you try to hide from yourself and play whatever game you play out in the world will show up through your kids. And so I think the greatest way to change the world is to become do everything that you can to become an extraordinary parent, right when we were talking about, oh, like how do you do it like whenever there's things and literally it happened. Mm -hmm. And so I just walked in there, she was crying and, and I just held her, mm -hmm. just held her and I held her and I held her. She's like, oh, oh. she just kept going, kept going, kept going and all of a sudden she just goes, donnez moi un bisou. It's like, can I have a kiss in French? <laughs> and it happened. Well, what you're describing is so important because you let her feel what she was feeling and not We were literally just talking about this. Right, because so often I think the, the immediate reaction is like, stop, stop. Like, yeah. why are you feeling that way? Don't, don't express that feeling. That's that the parent's negative. own tolerance. Right, but letting the child just feel what they're feeling holding them in love through the process and validating the feelings, it passes and they learn how to regulate their emotions that way. You know that song, Hush Little Baby? Mm -hmm. Think about the words. <laughs> yeah. This is what we're taught, domestication. <laughs> Hush little baby, don't you cry. Mm -hmm. This means my expression doesn't matter. I rewrote the song. <laughs> cry, little baby, won't you cry? You get to express what is in your heart. And if no words, it's still your truth. So no more hushing what's real for you. Cry, little baby. Won't you cry? Wow. There we go. We should just, uh, yeah, change <laughs> that song to that. <laughs> right now and put that in the history books <laughs> because if that baby stops crying yeah we don't we can think we know what the baby's crying for mm -hmm. oh this person took this ah, ah. but you don't even know that it was a pent-up thing from like two weeks ago so having a safe space well there's such an interesting perception of crying in our society in general and i've felt like i've gone through a whole journey around this because as I've been doing these different healing modalities and learning different somatic therapies and documenting it, I cry in a lot of these videos that I share because it's yeah. just what's happening in this container of healing is I'm releasing emotion and we release cortisol through our tears. At first, I had a lot of deep fear around sharing myself crying because it's like, people perceive it as being cringy and like really hard to watch or like weak or whatever. But we forget that like crying is such a natural mechanism built into our bodies to release stress and emotion. And we're taught all sorts of things about it societally. And I feel like if we had more safe spaces to cry, like we'd be experiencing such less stress, 
tension, arguments, like it's such a freeing, liberating feeling ultimately. Like crying and letting yeah. it out feels so good. Well, it's so why are we taught it, that it's yeah, bad, right? It's associated with vulnerability and vulnerability is considered weak. Mm -hmm. The happiest person you know is fighting a battle you know nothing about. That's because most people don't have that safe space. And so I was like, I just, I want to be free. And so I want to share what's really going on in the world. So in two, and it's, it's documented. 2012, I went on Facebook. I said, you think you know me? You have no idea. You know this and this and this and this and this is because that's what I told you. What you don't know right now, I'm living in my car. I'm $250,000 in debt. I'm living, uh, sleeping in an abandoned building. This is back in 2012. And I said, this is not where I'm going to stay, but this is a reality for me. And by 2015, I'm going to retire my mom. 2017, I'm going to be a multimillionaire. I'm saying all these things and people are laughing in the comment section. First message I got from somebody. Thank you for your strength. When I read your testimony, I put the gun down. So what I thought was weakness just saved somebody's life mm -hmm. because it spoke into the voiceless parts of humanity, which no people, a lot of people don't feel safe enough to express. And from that moment, I've been free. 2012, so this is 12 years ago. Yep. And in this time, look at the life that you have created. 12 years. Miraculous, like you are living a, an incredible life like with a beautiful family you're super successful you know you have decades of experience now and you're supporting millions of people and so from that point where you were vulnerable and shared that and share that you were living out of your car you know this is the reality I'm two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt between then and now and the life you've created now what would you say is like the single most potent factor that allowed you to transform your life the single most important factor is knowing that there was so much more inside of me. The purest and healthiest modality I've, I've ever contributed to is through the eyes, mind, and heart of the little kid inside of you in full self-expression. The reason why we're able to get so deep because most people have never felt that safe especially when I'm around a bunch of women, they're like, I've never felt that safe in the presence of another masculine man who doesn't want anything from me. Mm -hmm. So inside of my, my artist power retreats and in any containers that I do, highest, the highest value is safety. Mm -hmm. and if anybody compromises that, they will never be a part of it again. That's what separates us from a lot of people, especially in the healing and transformation space, because it's rare. The safety piece is, is so important. I absolutely have had situations where I felt unsafe. Those where I felt safe, you know, and now my body can better discern, my intuition can better discern like where I actually feel safe and maybe where there's something underlying that's not safe in my body. And that's something that, you know, we're all learning to navigate the truth of our intuition. But I think that that's such an important factor for inner child healing, it is like imperative that you actually feel safe in your nervous system. Right. Otherwise, it's gonna be very hard to create that container where you're able to really go there and allow uh, the expression to come out that needs to be seen or heard. Yeah, I think that's like such a important element to prioritize, like at the top of the priority, like you said, and, and this- safe, Top priority. Top priority. and you wouldn't be able to hold a safe container for others in this way if you did not first and foremost create that safety within you. Well, this is why it's not often really talked about mm -hmm. is because a lot of people don't hold that container within themselves. So they, they're not even vibrationally fit to talk about it. Mm. And I personally know, cause I literally used to be on the other side not knowing that I, the people that gave me this preconceived power just because I started being successful. I was just like, girls didn't like me when I was in high school. I was like, all these girls like me now? I was like, cool, and I was acting on it. But I had no idea what was happening. Mm. The moment I realized what was happening, I was like, oh my God, 
Now I know I, why I don't have a relationship with my daughter. Because I don't even know how to honor women truly. I don't even know how to honor myself. And then that's when I became the most powerful representation of who my daughter will marry one day. And that had me hold woman in her highest light. It is interesting how it's such a rare quality. <laughs> I know. It, it, it's crazy because when I talk but, about it, people are like, oh my God, that's the thing. I'm but, like, but dang. It, it's not that surprising because everything we're talking about is, you know, it comes from a wounded child. Right. Adults or deteriorated children is what you say. So if we have a bunch of men who are just actually scared little boys and unable to be safe inside their own body yeah. and minds and haven't learned how to create that safety for themselves, how would they create a safe right. container? And then women? in equal parts, women are often the victims and they don't even realize the energy that they're giving off because most of the time, not all women, women have been hit on so much mm -hmm that they're used to doing certain things to get attention, mm -hmm. don't even realize, and the casualness of their being is also some leaky sexual energy that then sends this guy to the moon, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it's this whole thing, so mo they're just not, un un they're unaware of how their energy comes off, mm -hmm. and then there's this whole thing that happens. I had I had this one, one lady was like, what? I've been to, a lot of perceived powerful people's retreats. And they said, why is yours feel way different mm -hmm. in a better way than theirs? I said, there are ethical people in this healing community and there are unethical people. Most are not ethical. Don't let the spiritual and healing part fool you. Do you actually believe that the most people in the spiritual realm are unethical? A lot of people, mm -hmm. I can't say most of them. I would say a lot of people and the stories that I hear and the things that I've been a part of and things that I've seen from highly revered people that I respect and see what they do afterwards, mm. I rarely hear through and through solid Integra stories, mm -hmm. things that they allow to happen, it's rare. Yeah. I so I can't say lot, I can't say most most yeah, that I've experienced. It's a lot to unpack because <laughs> ultimately, like, what's so interesting about like we talk about the spiritual realm, spiritual community, it's still just humans being humans. Yes. So there, it is the sense of like, oh, like, if you are a spiritual teacher leader, you're held to such a pristine high standard. Yet ultimately, like, we're all just human beings with our own shit that we're trying to navigate. Right. And so there's very few of those what you would call enlightened masters that are genuinely coming from like a very pure godlike essence on this planet in general. There's such a tiny percentage of those people. And it's also rare that somebody takes accountability for their actions. Yes. So there's all this brushing underneath the rugs, blaming, casting out, blocking, and all this. It, but it even happens in our government. Nobody takes accountability. I cannot respect mm -hmm. your leadership if you don't take accountability. I can't. And I think that's also something that women really desire in men, at least from my perspective. I want a man to take accountability for, you know, I, I want to take accountability too. Like we all need to take accountability for like where we can, you know, evolve yeah. and what we can learn from yeah. and how we can grow. And if we all could have the humility and drop the ego and take that accountability, like we can create so much learning and so yeah. much more progression through that. But it is, it's such a human trait to like allow the ego to want to defend. This was going to be my next question is like, so where are you taking accountability? Where are you like coming yeah. back to humility of like how you're wanting to evolve and improve? Here is where I, I made a mistake in, in this, in this realm of okay. what we're talking about is knowing certain uh, uh, individuals who let that other side get the best of them. And I judged them. Mm -hmm. I ju judged them for something I've done in the past. Because I was judged in the past. Instead of having a conversation, is everything okay? 
because I, I, I am equipped to have those conversations. Then pull them aside and be like, hey, what's going on? I mean, everybody else is judging you and blasting you in the media and things like that, but I, want, I would love to have a conversation with you. I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't put out the extended hand. So I got to experience the, like, the guilt and the shame of like, damn. Like I could have said something. I've been, I was judging people the last two years. Judging, 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 judging. I'm just like, that's not who I'm committed to being. So, you know, I, I've already taken full accountability yeah. to actually have the tough conversations if they're willing to have the conversations and pull certain uh, people aside. Uh, but not of made wrong bad. Right. Find out what's going on in your life. Yes. And say... You know, there's, there's a season you're going through and find yeah. a relatable ability pieces and see if we can do this. But the ultimately is like teaching people how to take accountability and not like run from it because you're going to be running for the rest of your life. Yeah. I think it's such an easy thing to like hear things. We hear stories yeah. and then we assume based on what we hear and we judge without actually having like a genuine conversation directly with the person we're hearing stories Absolutely. about. Absolutely. And it's this like toxic gossip loop. Yeah. And it, it's a lot harder to then have those real honest conversations. Right. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes, it takes letting go of judgment and coming into curiosity, which is like a huge part of what I'm passionate about practicing in my own life. Yeah. And sharing is the shift from judgment to curiosity because we, naturally the ego goes straight to judgment yep. to defend our own like worlds and worldview. And Yo, I was super ourselves. righteous for the last yeah. few years. I was super righteous and I didn't even realize it. Right. It's the unconscious thing. And now to have the awareness to say, oh, actually, like I was, I had that righteousness or spiritual elitism or yep. judgment that I was projecting. And to have that humility, to take accountability for that is huge. Yeah. Um, because that's the only way that by recognizing it, we can then shift into a state of genuine curiosity to have these conversations that need to be had in honesty and transparency. You know, I'm committed to that as well. And it's a, yeah. it's a, a quite a, a more challenging path, but it is worth it. It's a very challenging path. Yeah. And um, a lot of people just don't have examples. And I understand because I didn't. Mm -hmm. There was no man in my life mm -hmm. that I actually wanted to be like, like I wanted to model mm -hmm. that had the family, the money, the business, the, the wife, the, the, the beautiful lifestyle. Now there's people that had it, but I wasn't inspired by it. Mm -hmm. Like literally no one. Mm -hmm. They had little parts here and they had this, all this money, but no relationship with their family. So I literally had to picture what success in every area of my life could look like for me. And what looks like for me, it can be very different for you but you get the power and the right to define what that means for you. So once I did that, it was like in real time. And the one affirmation that had me going, I am the most powerful representation of who my daughter will marry one day. It was seeing myself different than what I had seen. Interesting. When I saw myself different, something miraculous happened. All these women around me, their relationships with their dads started changing. So that taught me about the power of projection and the power that women actually have. It's not in the doing, it's in the way that they see life. And when all of these people's relationships started changing, at the same time, my relationship was changing with my daughter and these women were like, my dad asked me out on a date. I haven't spoken to him in eight years. In the week that I asked my daughter on a date, it's because she's like, I wish my dad would ask me on a date. Okay, I can imagine my dad asked me on a date. I was like, yo, women are powerful. And I don't even know they know how powerful they are because they're <laughs> too busy doing shit. Well, <laughs> I think a lot of women, like, and from my experience, I fall into this trap of like just doing, doing, doing because we're in the very masculine based energetic. And you had to, you had society. to come up in this unhealthy masculine yeah. man's world. Right. So then we're taught a lot of times to shut down 
our intuition, our way, our, our, our beingness and a ability to just receive and see and these deeper intuitive gifts. Uh, we're not even taught to listen to our bodies. We're often taught to shut our bodies down and to completely cut off that part uh, and pathway of communication with ourselves. And when you start to bring that online again, it's like a whole new way of living and seeing the world. But to the point of like the doing, doing, I totally get caught in that very trap. And I'm like, how do I balance like my inner masculine and feminine in this yeah. world where you need to like do shit a lot of the time to make things happen? But also how do I trust that like by focusing on my vibration and my way of being and my magnetism that I will then create from that place that's yeah. something that I personally struggle with a lot. I want to share something with you and this, uh, ladies, listen up. <laughs> My wife had already, before I met her, she had a business where she was earning $500,000 a year. She worked really hard. She worked so hard that like hair would fall out. One day she came to me, not in a needy way, shoulders down, soft tone. She said, baby, I'm tired. I don't want to have to do what I did to get here. She's like, I just want to bake bread. I want to like hang out with my friends. I want to travel and do all these things. And she just looked at me. She looked up. She's like, will you take care of me? I don't know what it was about how she said it. Not what she said, how she did in her feminine essence, it wasn't demand. Something inside of me was birth. It's interesting how two months later, Artist Power, my company that has earned multiple millions, several years in a row, a art-based expression company, which is damn near almost unheard of, was birth. I realized the power of Woman, you heal the womb, you give birth to the man. Mm. My secret weapon, which is not a weapon, is my wife. Everything that people see out there, the reason why we're in Austin, billboards that I'm on, all these men's groups that I'm a part of, I think you should go to this party. No. So I think I just have a, and then I go and the magical things happen. Mm -hmm. But that's what Blair is for this family and me. She's the one with the true power. It's because in her being is literally like the ocean. The power of the ocean where they only have discovered 15%, but what's that strong that it can crush a submarine in 0 0.10 seconds? That's what I think the true power of a woman is. And most women don't even realize it because they're too busy trying to be energetically like a man. Because I think we're, we're taught to be. And yeah. And we're taught to you know, we've our power's been shut down like yeah society's been afraid of the power of a woman for a long time yeah i think we don't even know the extent of our power and as something that i'm just learning how to tap into in just a tiny little percentage and and i feel like this is definitely a sign for me to like deepen into understanding that wisdom and how to activate my feminine uh power in a different way. And I think it comes back to, again, the inner child feeling safe uh, because the little yeah. little girl sky that like had just abundance of creativity flowing through me. Yeah. That's really what wants to be expressed. And yeah. I am now being called to create the safety within myself mm -hmm. to allow that to come alive in yeah. a new way as an adult. So thank you for being such a powerful example and teacher and guide for me of how to hold that safety for my inner child and yeah. let her be free and liberated. It's just an honor. That's why I've always taken the time. Yeah. Always, no matter how long it was, I've yeah. always taken the time. So you know what that felt like. Thank you so much for that. You're so very welcome. Because you've always been there for me. Like I hit you up and you hold space for me and support me and I just really, um, yeah, I appreciate that on such a deep level. It's been so beautiful to witness. So thank you for everything that you share and how you impact this world. And it's just an honor to, yeah, call you a friend and to have the conversation like this we get to share. 
Yeah. yeah. Is there anything you want to just leave everybody with? Last thing for today. You can't hit a target you don't have. Your life should have some type of aim. The aim is the direction the rocket ship is going. Your vessel, you are the rocket ship. But a billion dollar rocket ship goes nowhere without the fuel. The fuel is that little kid magic that's inside of you. Do everything that you can to remember. Remember, 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 remember. Take the fuel of the little kid inside of you in their self-expression. Allow it to channel through this billion dollar rocket ship called capital Y-O-U and point it in a direction of your desire. Make sure it's connected to adding value to other humans. And whatever growth, whatever lessons, whatever teachings, whatever breaks down and builds up after you have those three components locked and loaded is a part of your flying lesson, mm -hmm. is a part of your growth process. And when you lean into it, it shapes you, it molds you, it cultivates you, and expands your capacity. And as your capacity expands and your vibration rises and your level of focus and groundedness has you here now and not everywhere else, this life will feel very effortless for you because you'll be playing a completely different game. If that's the only thing that I take away or that they take away from this, that there's so much gold in what you just said. Yeah. I'm like letting that sink into my body. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for this entire conversation. This is awesome. I'm going to link all of your stuff in the video description. Okay. So make sure you guys check that out. Thank you so much for tuning in. And that's it for this episode of Skyline. The adventure continues. Bye. <laughs> Hello, beautiful people. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Yeah. Uh.